Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, it's a good day, isn't it? Yes. A little bit cooler, the birds are singing. They're not getting overheated in the trees. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Well, I'm, I'm really, really pleased to be with you today. So it's a good day. I'm yeah. looking forward to it. We have a number of things that I want to visit about. I don't often bring a PowerPoint, although the last time we were together I did. Um, but we've got a PowerPoint. For some of you, uh, the information I'm going to provide is going to, you're going to say, yeah, <laughs> but some of you don't know this. And so I thought I would take an opportunity to talk about some things, including what we do, how we're organized, who does what, how we communicate, not so much what we communicate. Um, but then we'll finish up with uh, just reviewing a number of the things that, that we've accomplished this year. Um, in spite of all the challenges and the things around us that are going on in the world, there's been a lot of things that have been very successful and we're really pleased about those. So without further ado, we'll start out, we're starting out at the, at the base level. What is a life plan community? Some of you may remember the term continuing care retirement community. That's what we are. We is one. We are one, we is one. Um, so the goal of life plan communities is to provide a, a single campus where people can access multiple services without having to leave the campus. So some people, you know, may move into an apartment um, somewhere out in the community, and then they they need an assisted living, so they have to move somewhere else, and then they have to move somewhere else. And the, one of the benefits of a campus like this is that people establish friends and relationships, so that regardless of where you are on campus, people can find you. Oh, we can find you. That's what we <laughs> and uh, they, we offer services, and part of our objective is to help you retain your independence. And you know the critical factor is as long as you're safe. That's it. So what what we've found over the years, and this is Bob's anecdotal information. So that's consider that what it's worth. People who move into a community like this. Stay, tend to stay independent and out of their, out of longer term care services for about four and a half years longer than if they stayed in their own homes in the community. And the reason for that is, there, there are multiple reasons of course, but, but part of it is meals. I think you know, we all realize how important socialization is and being able to find meaningful things to do and purpose. And all those things combine with, with an environment where other people take some of the stress off the day-to-day -day, day -day routines. And so people tend to live longer, better, in these communities. And again, it's, uh, 
I saw some evidence for it one time, but who knows what, what that was true. I saw some evidence once also that said the crabbiest people live the longest, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> uh, you know, it might help. Many, if not all of us, have been to college, right? And on the college campus, you have a lot of different things that are available to you. And you, in, and you pay for all of it through your tuition, right? And you may only access part of it. And that's how a campus like this is. You know, some people really like the, the clinic and the wellness center. Other people love the transportation and so on. And so everybody together were, were um, providing a variety of services on one campus. And, and they're all available to you. And that's, that's one of the excitement things. So someone asked me, well, how, how many of what do you have? Okay, so we have 291 patio homes. And those homes are purchased on the open market by people who are age and income qualified, and they own their own homes. And each, each of those homes is in one of five homeowners associations. The HOAs take care of uh, many of the out outdoor things the lawns and, and other services. The individual who owns the home is responsible for everything in the home. So for example, if a furnace goes out, they get to repair that, or they pay for that repairman. And a lot of times people will have, you know, one of those in homeowners insurance programs or whatever, but they, ultimately the resident retains responsibility for, for the environment that they're, that they're in, okay? Now that's a little different than the apartments, the apartments, we have 188 of them, soon to be 187. We're going to combine two, uh, two smaller ones that make one bigger one. In the apartments, we provide um, all, the, all the services that we, uh, obviously, across campus, but we do the utilities, we do the maintenance, and all those kinds of things. And of course, in the apartments, you have indoor access on rainy and hot days, and, snow, and that occasionally snow day where you can uh, come, come indoors, and it's a little bit easier. <laughs> the cottages are similar, only they, they're separate. Rolling Green owns them, people pay an entry fee, like the apartments, and they get 80% of that entry fee back when the unit resells, when it's vacated. And that's how the apartments work as well. Almost everybody has one of those 80%, we call it 80% return of capital. There, there's just a smattering of some that are a little bit different. Okay. We have uh, Cedars Assisted Living, and that's assisted living, and it is uh, over off the, off the front of this building, and it has room for 28 folks, and it is a, a basically a fee-for-service program, and we, we provide 24-7 staffing, meals, and of course, we take care of all the environmental and activities and program and those kinds of things as well. Then we have Evergreen Place, Memory Care. And we do the same thing, it's licensed as assisted living, but it's licensed as a special assisted living. Why is it special? Because it's, it's a specialized area for people with memory loss. And um, it's frankly one of my favorite areas. Um, it's, it's, a, it's really a fun place, it's really a fun place. I've got my room picked out. <laughs> um, True. Do you plan to go soon? I, do I plan to go soon? It may be sooner than any of us want. <laughs> uh, then we've got the health center, and you may hear us call this several different things. Uh, the health center has room for 72 people. It's a licensed nursing home. Okay? Now, a licensed nursing home can have several different levels of care. Um, and the first basic level is just the state licensure, that's state licensure. Then we are federally certified to provide Medicare services there. And what that means is that if you have the traditional Medicare or some insurances and you go there, you can get rehabilitation and those kinds of things. And Medicare, believe it or not, doesn't pay for everything, but it does pay for the first 10 days, if you're there that long, um, and, or the first 20 days, I'm sorry. And after that, there's a co-insurance, and sometime we'll talk more about that. But uh, Medicare, as you know, is an insurance, and it does not pay for long-term care. Okay? Okay. Now, we also have some other stuff. Rehab, what is that? Well, that is a part of the health center. We just call it rehab. 
for obvious reasons. And we primarily use that for people who are, who are moving through the community. Uh, they come in, they get rehabilitated with uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech, and then many of them go home. So 75% of the people who go through there are actually from the greater community, and that's a great marketing tool for us. And 25% are, are from on campus. A small per percentage of the people who go through, the, through that area either move to assisted living or to the nursing home area, um, and, but most of them go home. In the normal year, which we haven't seen, and some of you have never seen a normal year here, um, normally we'll have about 350 people go through the rehab area in a year. And so it's a very, very busy place, um, and it's very intensive. We also have other services. We have the clinic, and stay tuned, I've got some good news for you later on on the clinic. Uh, we've got home care, transportation, and so on. So if you look at this list, one of the things that you might think is, which one of these do we run? And we, we actually run, we're running five or six, depending on how you count it, five or six or seven different businesses simultaneously. So it's a very complicated environment, which explains why some people think, I don't understand everything going on here. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit and how to get some more information. That's, uh, that's, that's the services that Rolling Green offers. If we can go to the next slide. This, this is just a quick slide. I only have 75 slides more, so um, <laughs> this is a quick slide. Rolling Green it com is comprised by 75 acres. And of the 75, this is all trees. It's all trees about yay big. And uh, we also have considerable green space and those kinds of things. We own about a third of that big lake, maybe 40%. Um, we may own 40% of the area, but 25% of the water, I don't know. Um, but we have, we have five homeowners associations, and it's, a, it's a, our honor to help and to work with those and to manage for those five, and so we're, we're very pleased and honored about that. Um, then I have some quick facts for you. Not that everything until now hasn't been factual, okay? Um, Rolling Green opened in 1986, and when it opened, actually shortly before it opened, um, all the apartments burned down. It was a huge, huge fire. And uh, I think it was Russell Smart who jumped on a, uh, a front end loader, bulldozer, and separated the buildings so that more wasn't more wasn't uh, caught on fire. So we actually rebuilt all the apartments um, at that time. So you're in new apartments since 1986. Yeah. Now the, that was A, B, C, and D. Now the E building was, was built in the mid 90s. Okay. Um, Rolling Green Village is a not-for-profit organization. We are 501c3, a charitable organization. Now, um, we're charitable in the sense that uh, we can receive gifts. Uh, we, see, we receive certain tax benefits, but we also provide a service to the greater community. And we can talk about that more in, in a little bit. But today we're serving between 750 to 800 people who live here. This is in addition to that 300 plus that normally would go through our rehab. Now if you think about that, if everybody has four kids, or family. If you take that thousand people or so who use our services in a year and multiply that times the number of families and families' families and volunteers, today we are affecting thousands of community members through Rolling Green, through our service to you. Different way to look at it. Typically, <laughs> we have about 275 staff members. We're about 25 uh, people down. Some of those are part-time and some are full-time. We are having good success in, in bringing new people in. It's still slow, but we're seeing really positive, good positive progress towards that. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that. And I, I know you are too. Um, so we're, we're rejoining and regaining and returning to some of the services that we've had in the past, and notably food and beverage. And we're working on housekeeping as well for, uh, for the patio homes. 
So stay tuned. Uh, we're not ready to announce yet, but stay tuned. We are working on that, and as we've been working on for this for this entire time. Um, we have about 423,000 square feet under roof. That's under this roof. It's all contiguous. And plus the cottages. So it's a huge amount of space. Um, I've already talked about nursing homes, 350 people. All right. You can ask questions if you'd like. But we'll, we'll go to the next slide. There we go. How is the village organized? All right. I'm going to explain something that might be a little more challenging, but let me explain it. A not-for-profit organization, such as the hospitals, who owns the hospital that is a not-for-profit hospital? The community does, right? And the, the not-for-profit hospital is run by a board that is elected, that serves the community on, on a voluntary basis to serve the greater community through the services of the hospital, right? That's how Rolling Green is. It is, it is a community service, which is why it's 501c3. It is not owned by anyone, per se. It is a community benefit and service, and that's, that's our job. Our mission is to serve the greater community particularly in serving you, okay? So we, we have an elected board, and the board, like the hospital, is self-electing. They, they do nominations and so on. Uh, they have a process that the board goes through. They are uh, responsible for the board policies, and I'll explain that in a minute. And that's the mission, the ends, and the executive limits. What in the world is that? Well, we all know what a mission statement is. I usually boil it down to, you know, we're going to serve people so that both residents and staff have a better life because they're here. And that's in, a, in an environment with Christian ethics and perspective. That's it. Ends. Ends are a fancy way of saying, what in the world is an organization for? Why? In the end of it, what is it for? What is its purpose? And that's deeper than the mission. But there are certain things that Rolling Green is four. One is to serve seniors, to serve more seniors over time, and we are. It is to ensure the, the financial uh, strength and reliability of the organization so it is self-sustaining. So those are, those are three of the ends. There's a, there's a couple more, but most of them relate and revolve around the purposes of the organization. And, and the board actually owns those and it holds me accountable to them, okay? Then there's the policies. Okay, this is also a little more challenging maybe. Everybody is, most people have served on, on some kind of board or another, right? Now, um, many of the boards in organizations, including our local hospitals, at least Prisma, and I believe Bon Secours, I'm not sure, but. Um, and many of the not-for-profits um, that the, the Christian School on Woodruff, they run under what's called policy governance. What is that? Okay, the policy governance has four pieces. One is the ends, which we talked about, the purposes of the organization. And if the purpose of the organization are met, then the organization is, is accomplishing its purpose, right? Okay? Well, so that means, Bob, I can do whatever to, to accomplish those ends, right? No. So there are limitations that are put on me, specific. So for example, um, I'm not to use, misuse funds. I'm not to allow the misuse of funds. I'm not to sell the property. <laughs> You know, and there, um, and I, I am not to operate without a budget. And you know, so there, there are a, ser a series of limitations. They don't tell me what to do. They just tell me what I can't do. So, for example, I, I can't operate without a budget. Well, why is that? Well, if I know what the purposes of the organization are, and I know my limitations, anything outside of that is fair game. 
meaning we can expand services, we can look for new services to develop, and we'll talk about one coming. I'm really excited about this. And some other things that we make available to you, and it gives us the ability to do that. And I'm accountable to the board for that. Well, so what's this management contract? Um, I mentioned that this is a very complicated business, probably five different businesses simultaneously. It is also the most heavily regulated business in the country, hands down. We surpassed the Nuclear Regulatory Commission years ago. <laughs> Seriously. It is the most heavily regulated, particularly in the nursing home and then in the assisted living, and, but even in the independent apartments and even in patio homes. We have regulations that we are required to meet. And that somebody in some government agency, probably about 27 different agencies, literally, um, hold us accountable to those. So one of, the, one of the limitations on me is we won't operate illegally. Okay, so I have to have some understanding of, of OSHA and DHEC and CMS and all that, all that fun stuff, okay? And I'm licensed to do that. Well, because it's such a complicated thing, to have nine to 15 people come from the community and say, here you go, run it. That's a little hard. And so many organizations like ours often affiliate with others because that way you have a, a corporation that can run them all. Or um, they establish a management contract. And that's in fact what, what uh, our board did probably about 25 years ago. Established a management contract with life, and life care services. What does that mean? Okay, the board is responsible for the ends and for creating limitations for me. And I have to prove that we're meeting those ends and staying within the boundaries every year. And by third party um, proof. The management contract comes in and says, okay, we are a professional organization and we'll provide Bob and Rolling Green Village with the support we need to operate within the boundaries of the law, within best practices and those kinds of things. And that's what the management contract does. So the operations of the organization are really underneath me. And, um, and so I'm, I'm, you've known this all the time, I'm a real operator. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's, that's where the operations come from. Now underneath me, we have the department head department heads, and we have a, a number of them, and they're responsible for carrying out the operations. And, you know, basically I coordinate with them. And so you can see we have on the far left, that's fund development, there's Jane in the corner. We have financial services, Lynn, she's got her green uh, eye shades on and, and buried in a computer somewhere. We've got Ruth in charge of marketing. We have food and beverage. Uh, that Bruce is responsible for. We've got plant maintenance, there's Skip over there. We have a director of nursing who is over taking care of our, of our most frail people, uh, Legree. We have community life and wellness, that's Amy. And we have resident health services, that's Shannon. Now in addition, and in addition to that, we have um, our spiritual services, which is David. There you are. And we have human resources. We have a professional human resource department here under Teresa Watkins to, to help me keep things straight and to tell me where I need to be and probably to tell me where to go occasionally uh, is Lindsay. And so she's uh, the executive assistant here and she's like all these people, they're, they're outstanding. The front desk reports to Lindsay. I can't do this alone. And that's why we have a management contract and a, an agreement for people to support. We have, like I said, between 750 and 800 people living here. It cannot be done, done adequately alone by one person. And so consequently, we have an associate executive director, Ryan Turner, who's been here longer than me. And it may seem like I've been here already too long today, but um, Ryan is, is 
an outstanding administrator and associate executive director in charge of all the licensed areas and all the services that we provide there. And he, he handles a lot more of the day-to-day the -day regulatory complexities and some of the issues that are there. So that's our leadership team. And so each person, many of these people have you know, several people reporting to them. You know, Amy has, has several. Um, and you know, Jane and the chaplain don't have anybody reporting to them. They're, they're one person offices, but they, they have their specific duties involved. And we've delegated the responsibility for these things. Well, how do they know what to do? Well, that's again why we have a management contract. We have operational systems and policies and procedures for every department. And they're actually quite quite thorough. We review our ability to, prefer, to per, uh, perform underneath those policies and procedures at least once every 18 months. We do a specific review. We call it the QS. Um, and most of our people don't say it's much fun. But we review them to make sure that we're doing the best that we can. Now, we, we have certain notable items um, I mentioned, uh, let's see, I think we're one back. Oops, nope. I got, I got behind myself. Now, how do, how do these department heads connect with and communicate with residents? As none of us knows everything that people need and how to do it in the way that they need. So we need connection points. Now I had somebody the other day say, well, well Bob, you didn't tell me that, we, we did, that this and this and this was gonna happen. And it's like, well, it was in the weekly highlights. Um, it was on the portal. It was in a letter. We had announced it in a meeting. I'm not, and then we sent out a one call. I'm not sure what more we could have done to communicate that. And it, you know, other than call you individually, which frankly one call did. Now, uh, well, there's too many one calls. I, I understand. Yeah. But we do have a number of ways that we that we are attempting to communicate with residents. And I mentioned the highlights, the Touchtown, this meeting. We have the fireside chats, as exciting as they are. Sometimes you see a dog. Um, we have the Village Voice. I love that Village Voice. It's so it's so cool. Um, we have periodic letters. And of course, during COVID, we had too many periodic letters. We have, with the HOAs, we have a, a meeting with just the HOA presidents to talk about those kinds of issues. We have spiritual services, and we have a variety of spiritual services. Um, then we have resident groups and various affinity groups. Then we have a resident handbook. Do you remember that? <laughs> we have a handbook um, that has a lot of detail in it. Um, as to where things are and how to get access to them. But so far, this has all been one way, towards you. So where do you get your information back to us? And you know, there's one-to-one -one conversations. But more importantly, we have advisory committees in which we work with the residents. Now, we are responsible, staff is responsible for the operations and for running the budget, the capitals, and making those decisions. However, we want to communicate with and, well, with our residents to better uh, serve and to inform and to provide information and a chance for feedback that's in a group setting. Why is it in a group setting? Because if you talk with one person, um, I had one person the other day say, well, um, I like my beans, literally, I like my beans without salt on them. And, Another person said, I really like them with salt. What are we supposed to do? That's why we have committees. And in those committees, we go through a variety of different things. So we've got the, uh, the resident association, Bob Torres, he's the president. Um, we have uh, our engagement committee, and that talks about the program and, and what we're doing to help encourage and get people to uh, engage in things. Because when you engage into meaningful activities for you, you live longer. And frankly, it makes you happier, happier. And Amy's in charge of that one. We have a financial advisory committee. What is that? Well, we actually review the finances with this committee. And Lynn Lentz 
is responsible for that committee, and I, I meet with that committee as well. And uh, for example, this last March, when we had our annual audit, we are audited annually by an outside auditor, and it's a full audit. Um, the auditor met with a couple board members and that finance committee to answer questions and to review our financials. By the way, that information is also in the disclosure statement, which you can get at marketing. Food committee, we actually have a legitimate food committee that has been around for a really a long time. And that's the group that we listen to to help us understand what the issues are with food and, and if there are, and what the right amount of salt on the beans is. Okay. And um, like, like any of these committees, we take them very seriously and we really want a dialogue and it's the place where we, we hope and we ask for people to give us feedback. And in that feedback, you know, even good and bad, but again, it's in, in we, we live in a com and work in a community, so we're trying to get information and to work through and into issues as a community, which takes longer, by the way. You know, what it, somebody once told me, God so loved the world, he didn't create it by a committee. <laughs> you know, so there, there, there is a reason for that. We also have a plant maintenance committee, and they, you know, we've had some long talks about the new patio down below and the sidewalks, and, and we'll talk about some other things for there as well. Then we have other ad hoc, I'll just call them ad hoc meetings with residents and management. So we have, you know, if there's an issue and there's a group of people who want to talk about it, we talk about it. You know, we're not hiding. But we also know that decisions that we make are made in the context of community and what's in the best interest, as best we can tell for all. Then we have the HOA board meetings, and the HOAs each have their own meetings as well. And there are other connection points. And my point is simply this. We have long-standing ways that we use to uh, communicate with you and to get you information. And we can't be responsible for people reading information. And I know there's a lot of stuff that goes out. I get that. But we're trying to trying to communicate. Now, if there's something that we need to communicate that you're not hearing, take it to one of these committees or to, to one of the department heads or myself. Help us, help us help you. But we do have, and when I talk about these committees, 68% of the people who live in the cottages and apartments have been new since the pandemic started. And a little over 30% of the people in the patio homes so you, you folks may not have ever known that we have these systems because they were gone during the pandemic because we have one purpose, keep people safe. And that, that basically eliminated many of the systems that we have. And so we're trying to help people understand what they are and get back into the regular routines for those things. And it's, it's taking a while. Plus, we know that we've grown significantly during the pandemic which means that some of the systems that we did have don't work. And so we're, <laughs> imagine that. And so we're identifying those and, and taking them on one by one to get them addressed. Um, so it takes a while, but we are working on that. And that's one of the things that we do. Um, last time we met together, um, I, I did a, a full presentation on personnel policies and how we handle them and they are handled under the law and with a professional HR person here, or people here, plus we have HR consultants that we work with. And um, so one of, the, one of the things that we, that is in our policy is that we do not, and this is actually a South Carolina law, resident staff members are not allowed to ask residents for money. It's, it's, just, it's the law. And frankly, it's an ethics thing too. Uh, because people might curry favor by doing that. And that's why we have the, the annual um, uh, gift that comes to just the hourly personnel once a year at Christmas time. And that's all by donation from the residents. And uh, Rolling Green does not handle the money. Uh, we may help write the checks, but we don't, we don't keep, we don't count, we don't do any of that. That's all resident, resident managed. And it's an, it's an awesome way for people to, to say thanks to the staff. And so one of the things that uh, 
an, an announcement, and I'll just kind of brief briefly. Um, many of you know Victor in mm -hmm. in Wellness, yeah. and unfortunately, he's no longer with Rolling Green. And I can't go into detail. Um, we're going to miss him. He's a good man. Um, but I did want to tell you, and so in the interim, we will be finding some people to, to help us with some of the fitness classes and so on. And I know there will be all kinds of rumors flying. Trust me, you can only only uh, believe a rumor as far as it, you can read it. Um, and we, we can't discuss you know some of those internal things. But we are going to miss him. And we I just wish him the best. But um, now we do. Uh, we have we've had questions on uh, on meal points. You have you can carry over two hundred a month for the apartments, and at the end of the year, because of accounting reasons, they have to go to zero um, because they have to reset. Um, for those of you who are in the patio homes or the cottages, and you have the meal cards or tickets. Those, those don't expire. Who knows? I'm not an accountant. But there's some things that we need your help with. Um, have you heard of COVID? No. Uh, today, today um, we have two people who are quarantining, two residents um, in, in these independent areas. Um, that's the only, only COVID that we're aware of. The rates in the community are still well over 20%, or the last ones I saw were like 23%. So the rates are still high, they're still out there. We've got 800 people here, plus 200 staff, and we've only got two people out with uh, COVID. That is, you know, I, I hate it for those two people, you know, but um, the, the, the systems that we were putting in place and the care that we're taking with one another is working. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really thankful for that. Um, we do ask, you know, we encourage masks. Um, I can see all of them here. <laughs> um, and there is, please feel welcome if you want to wear a mask, please feel welcome. We'd encourage that, okay? It's not a requirement, but we encourage it. If you do travel out of the country, we ask you to self-quarantine when you return. And Shannon um, or Jane in, in the clinic can help you with that. Um, for the pandemic, uh, because of the pandemic, we couldn't, we could not bring people together in groups. And so I already talked about the committees and some of the communication stuff. The way that we normally help people orient and become part of Rolling Green Village didn't happen. And which I think we're seeing some of the, some of the results of today. Not that they're bad results, it's just people feel like they don't know. And I, I get that and we're trying that's why we're doing this presentation right now, is, is to help people feel like, all right, we've got a base of understanding of how, how this place is supposed to work anyway. So that's what we're working on. Uh, rehab was closed last December, uh, that rehab area. We were still doing rehab, and we were welcoming our own residents, but we didn't take people from the outside. Uh, because we always, you get preferential treatment, and we're, we are sure of that. But we were able to reopen it, um, mid mid August, August 9th. August 9th, and so we just we have it half halfway opened. Why only halfway? Staffing. Oh, imagine that. Uh, critical staffing. I, I read a, an interesting article. I look back to see what kind of data is available in the marketplace about staffing and long term care in organizations like ours, and I found an article from 2019 before the pandemic. Guess what the title was? in of that article. Staffing crisis shortages in long-term care. Then I read another article during the pandemic. 15% of people who were working in this field left it permanently. So we're making progress, but it helps it helps put a put a perspective around some of the challenges. Um, we are establishing new normals. We do have, you know, double programming. Yeah, didn't Ollie start yesterday? Yeah. Yeah, Ollie started yesterday. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm excited about that. In fact, I got a, I got a call from a neighbor uh, who doesn't live here, and she said, I'm so excited that Rolling Green has got Ollie now. 
like, wow, all right. I don't know how she heard about it, but that's all right. Um, we have a bunch of services that we provide you all, and, and all y'all, I should say. We are in South Carolina. But we've got the emergency call systems. We've got uh, the security systems. We've got scheduled local transportation. We've got maintenance of the common areas and so on. Um, planned activities, personal services, preferred access to Cedars, Evergreen, healthcare and rehab. We have the RGV assurance, that's what I call it. Um, some people call it resident assistance, some call it benevolent program. We promise to you that if no fault of your own, you run out of money, you stay here. How do we do that? Well, <laughs> we ask for donations. I, I'll be honest, you know, we, we need your help with that. And that makes a significant difference in helping us. And last year we provided about $160,000 plus of care and services to, to people who would run out of money. We have an application process. Um, Ryan, Lynn, and I are the ones who know, and that's it. Um, I have the files confidentially locked in my office. So we don't, we don't go around telling people, but we do provide services. Um, and I know, you know, we've already, uh, we're gonna be talking about inflation in a, in a few minutes. And uh, I know that's a worry, but I do want you to know that we have this insurance program and we always have. <coughs> and that's, again, that community service and we provide that. Something you know, that we provide here that is unique to Rolling Green. We have, we have uh, several nurses who work full time here for the independent living areas. So we have Shannon, who's an official nurse navigator, who's been trained to help people work through the through the healthcare system. But they also also with Jane and Linda, they're they're helping respond to emergencies. But also, when someone is is sick, a lot of times they'll just call and say, you know, I'm not feeling well, and they'll go up and check them. Um, this is actually the second retirement community I've been in in 42 years that has that. And the first one was a completely different model and she worked part-time, five days a week. It's an incredible benefit. Um, and then of course we have the clinic itself. We have generator powered um, emergency access areas. What's that? Every once in a while we do have power outages. Uh, the longest one that, that I remember, and it was long, it was 30 hours. That was a long time. We have uh, emergency power now for the, the main kitchen and the dining areas that runs not only the full kitchen, but also the heating and air conditioning ventilation systems. And it's an assembly area. So 30 below, which hopefully will never happen here, 30 below, we, we lose power. We've got a place where people can stay, patio homes, apartments. We also have, um, in the last two years, we've connected generator power to a number of the elevators in the apartments. And so now every apartment has access to an elevator that is, has generator power. And we didn't have that before. Now in the newer buildings, we have it on the main elevator as well. And we also have it in the kitchen and some of those areas. So we've got ways for people to get to that access area um, if we run out of power. Um, we have uh, the fitness program, we have multiple meeting rooms. My HOA, where I live, uh, was trying to find a place where the, the HOA could hold its meeting and they ended up having to pay somebody to, and you know, you know those are the kinds of things that we have here because we are. Um, one of, the, one of the things that's my favorite is we've got a full-time chaplain. I've never worked in an organization that had a full-time chaplain before, and David is such a blessing to us all. Amen. I just, Amen. Um, you know, we have dining, dining, you know, we know the hours are being extended to 19. I'm, I'm excited about that, I know residents are. We're not able to do uh, family yet, friends and family in the evening yet. We're working on it, stay tuned. Um, Services, we have the resident portal, and I know how much people really love the portal. Um, so, okay, how do we pay for all this stuff? Well, you. <laughs> um, yeah, we can go there we go. 
This is the sources of revenue that make Rolling Green run. So 31% of the revenue, and this is, it says uh, 2021. I checked this out in July and it's pretty much the same uh, this year as well. But about 31% of our, of our income comes from apartments, 5% from the cottages, 10% uh, from the petty homes, assisted living pays about 8%, uh, memory care pays about 5%, healthcare pays 30%, and rehab uh, covers about 11%. So if you look at that, about 40 to 41% of the revenue to make Rolling Green run actually comes from the health center, from, from the nursing home and the rehab area. And keep that in mind because I'm, I'm coming back to that one. Well, where do the people live? Well, we have, a, we have a graph for that too. This is the percent of residents in each living area. Uh, starting on the right, uh, the apartments, about 27% of our, of our people live in the apartments, 5% in the cottages, 55% in the patio homes, 3% in the assisted living, 2% in the memory care, 6% in health care, and 2% in rehab. That means 8% of the people who are, who are here and receiving services pay 41% of the cost. Yeah. Whoa. Those areas are expensive and there's no way around it. No way around it. Well, let's take a look at the comparison of revenue to residents. Okay. Uh, what we have is the apartments, the, the blue, I guess it's blue and teal. Does that make sense? So the, the blue is the, the percentage of residents on our campus, and the teal is the percentage of the revenue that they, that they pay for the total. And so, you know, the apartments were about 31% of the revenue, and they're about 27% of the, of the people. Um, cottages, about the same. Patty homes, we have a lot more patty homes than residents. Assisted living, memory care, health care, and rehab. Those two. You know, again, 8% of the people with 41% of the revenue. These are just interesting facts to know. And I, I'm not trying to make a point other than it's interesting to see, you know, where, where the revenue comes from, who's paying it, what, what we're getting, and so on. We'll keep going. Now, we, we completed the expansion. You know, one of the lessons I've learned is don't open a building during COVID. <laughs> and I think you learned that with me. <laughs> Um, you know, the master plan for that actually was, was approved in 2017, October of 2017. There was a rationale for that master plan. And the ends of the organization from the board include serving more elders and enhancing the financial strength. Wait a minute, what's that all about? Remember how 41% of our revenue is from 8% of our re residents? When Medicare goes away, or we reduce the number of people who are serving on Medicare, as we have done this year, it kills our revenue. Consequently, we're, we're well behind in our revenue. Now, we've, we've flexed expenses heavy, heavily, but um, the organization, it's kind of funny. Um, at, at Clemson, there, there's a pendulum, right? And, and it's a 36 pound, I think it's a metal ball, that's on, uh, on the bottom of a 96 foot, I think it's a 96 foot uh, chain, and it swings. And it's, it's designed so that actually you can see the curve, uh, how the, the earth is rotating, it's kind of interesting. But the question is, here's this huge ball that's at least twice of my weight, <clears throat> and um, it's swinging back and forth, and the question is, why doesn't the building move back and forth with the swing? And it's because the building has mass. Okay, and it holds it, and so it steadies it. Okay, if Rolling Green is smart, we will build to the mass around healthcare because we want to provide that healthcare for you if you ever need it. But we don't want it to swing our revenues and, and our financials back and forth. We want more stability. And they decided, the board decided that in 2017. And that's why we added 60 apartments and 23 cottages because it builds to the strength and the mass around. It's not that we're after lots of money because we're not for profit. What it does, the stronger we are financially, the more mass it has, 
the more it protects your contracts into the future. Simple. The reason I know that is I've, I've worked in organizations that did not do that. That's why I worked there. Not to lose money, but um, they were in trouble, and so my job was to get them out of trouble. Okay? So, you know, we've got the apartments and cottages and the commons building. Village center res uh, renovation, about 16, 16,000 feet. This building, this room, and several others. We also renovated the kitchen in Evergreen Place. And we, we put a, a generator on that so that we can always provide food and warmth for the rehab and the, the memory areas. So that, that was a major project as well. We also added that uh, huge generator outside of, uh, outside of the, the new Commons building. And then we put in a 500 kilowatt generator down here that handles everything in uh, rehab, evergreen place, and the healthcare kitchen. Again, our strategy is <clears throat> take a look at what, what do we have that could fail in the case of an emergency. And one of those is power. And so we've been working at that over the years to, to fix that. Our challenges today, COVID, it's still here. You know, we're doing well and the systems are working. You know, we'll, we'll tighten them up as we go along as, if we need to, but hopefully we won't need to. I call it the staffing apocalypse. It's not behind us, but we're making progress. I'm, I'm, I'm more than guardedly optimistic now. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that we're, I know we're gonna get through this, but it's still gonna take us a while. The economy and inflation. I sent out a letter a month ago. I know I made people nervous. And the purpose wasn't to make anybody nervous, but the purpose is to help you understand what's happening in the market that is affecting us. Um, I am on a committee that serves, um, directly serves 10 other organizations, works with 10 other organizations like this in the state. And I also was in a meeting last, last week with, with uh, our management company that operates about 140 of these. And asking people what the rate increases are gonna be, frankly. And everything I heard was between eight and 10%. Seriously. I know it's going to be heavy this year, and, and the number one reason for that is our, uh, our wages, the cost of our wages have, have increased, increased nearly $2 million on a budgeted year when we're fully staffed. Thankfully we're not, so it doesn't cost that. Uh, but the, the reality is, is uh, you know, people wonder you know, what causes inflation. Well, I don't know. I'm not an economist. But what I do know is that people get raises, they can now afford the stuff, but now the stuff is more expensive to make. Yeah. And it seems like everybody kind of stays where they are. Um, and it, except for the people on fixed incomes. And I get that. Somebody told me I don't have a clue. I do have a clue. Um, but that's why we have the, the insurance program. I don't know yet. I, I don't have the rates to announce right now. But I gotta tell you, we gotta pay for that, pay for those wages. And frankly, I, I'm honored that we can pay for those wages. But with inflation and the way it is, I don't want anybody to be surprised when you get a letter. And we're gonna to try to get those letters out early and talk about them. But I, you know, I just wanna be straight about the issues. Um, we are seeing contracts for services that are being doubled. Yeah. <laughs> we, you'll love this one. We, we have a phone line in, in one of the elevators, and uh, you know we're required to have it, that's the law. And it's never used, by the way, don't use it, please. <laughs> and uh, actually it was in a couple elevators, and we paid $235 a month to maintain that. We just got the notice that it went up to $1,000. <laughs> and they don't do anything. <laughs> but I want you to understand, we are working really hard and one of the things that, that Skip is charged with is finding ways to do things in such a way that it costs us less to do them. So like utilities and efficiencies and those kinds of things. And we've been working really hard on that for a couple of years. And that's a number of the projects that we've had. We've had. And they're being effective. You don't see it as much because the costs are going up. But it is. It is what it is. <laughs> earlier this year I talked about, we, we had a maximum of 50 vacancies earlier this year. What happened? Uh, did everybody leave because they're mad? No. 
No. Over a period of two years, we couldn't bring anybody in to market, so they couldn't see the apartments. We have about 22 vacant apartments a year, something like that. So that explains most of it right there. Um, I am pleased to announce that right now we have 10 uncommitted units. Your marketing department has done a phenomenal job. They, they, they have worked crazily hard and they have done a really good job. I'm really proud of them. And what does that mean for you? It's that stability thing. And it's that strength. Now to, to get them so they could sell all those units, we'll start going through some of the things. This is just a list of the, of the refurbishments we've done in, in apartments and cottages this year. There are 42 that we did that are done, and we have eight more that, that we're doing. Um, that has been, and the contracts the, and the cost for doing this doubled. And that has used almost all of our capital dollars this year. So some of the things that, that we have planned to do this year, we, we haven't been able to do. We're trying to get to them now because we, the board graciously freed up a little bit more capital. Not a whole lot, but they gave us some room to move. So we're able to finish the refurbishments, put in the sidewalk and those kinds of things. We'll go to the next one. Hallways. How much do you suppose those hall, that hallway project cost? Oh, yeah, twice as much as it used to be. Yeah, that's right. It's several hundred dollars, hundred thousands of dollars. <laughs> Why? Well, because we have five buildings with two and three floors each, and then we, we we get a lot of damage on the walls, and so we put yeah. some stuff on it that when you hit it, it's, you slide off it. <laughs> and we repainted them. Um, so that's just the refurbs and, and that project alone have taken an enormous amount of time. And you, you don't think about it, well, it's contract. Well, you gotta coordinate that, and there's always something. We'll go to the next one. We refreshed all of rehab. It was empty, and it needed refreshing. It hadn't been redone since 2012. So we, we painted and cleaned, and we did a deep clean, and so we took advantage of that. <coughs> the front entry, this is wrong. <laughs> this is terribly wrong. You see those vertical things? Those are poles? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, when I drove in this morning, yeah, half of them are done. And what they've been working on, you know, while it looks like they're not doing anything when they're out there, they're actually putting the clips so that they could install the, install the stuff. So it's, it's moved along. I don't know how far it is today, but it's going to be close to done soon. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really thrilled because it kind of hides a really ugly area. Um, dog park. We're getting some donations. I'm excited about it. It's a project. It's got a lot of challenges to it. Um, and part of it is, is the area, uh, part of it is the dogs themselves, uh, part of it is us, um, and kind of being out of, out of sync with one another. We're getting there, we're getting there. Um, there's, a, there's a large pad. Um, I, you, how big is the pad for the dog park? Well, the pad for the dog park is 20 by 40. 20 by 40. So that's, I mean, that's, that's the concrete pad, that's not the running area. Yeah, the concrete pad is just 20 by 40, so there's room for tables. Uh, there will be a double door there so you know uh, your dog can't run away from you that quickly um, and so and then there'll be there's a fence that's been ordered uh, we're still working on the grassing and what on the on the surface there's a couple options um, there will be some some elements to provide shade um, some of those are yet to be determined exactly how we're, we're thinking of using those those fabric sails um, that are colored and, and very pretty and we we anticipate uh, we're hoping to do that on the, the patio that's just opposite that. Well, why did we take the patio out? Number one, it was broken and it was sloped. So um, number two, the reason it was broken and sloped is because the tree roots lifted it up and broke it. And they were, uh, what kind of trees were those? Gum. They were, yeah, gum. yeah, gum trees, gum. sweet gum trees. They dropped those little, those little balls. They, they, yeah, you step on them and they, well. Um, we took those trees out, which eliminated the shade. 
<laughs> unfortunately. But we got we got a new pad in, and we're looking at getting sails for that too, so that they're shaped. Because and we made the pad significantly larger because we know how many people enjoy it. Well, how do you get that? Get down there? Well, we widened the sidewalk and we added the sidewalk out here. So we've added some significant sidewalks for safety, and we've also made them wider so two people can walk side by side, or you can walk with your dog, you know, either way. Um, but that's that project is, is coming along, it takes a while. We, we have water for the dogs down there, and we have water for the gardens, and that's all coming. So there's gonna be some time. For a while, it may be a little muddy, unless we can figure something else out, but um, stay tuned. Um, donations created, an opportunity for a golf cart. Now this isn't what they do all day, okay? <laughs> but our healthcare residents love this thing. They can get out and about and see the campus. Before it was just like two at a time, but now we, you know, now it's a, a, a larger number of people and I'm really excited about that. And the dog is not the driver. <laughs> um, the library, one of the things, this the second library is beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. And some of you guys, some of you men and women made those bookshelves, right? Yeah, yeah so working together, we created a, a place for the books, and then the library committee has done just an, 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 an amazing job in getting all those books. And so we have two libraries. Who has two libraries? You know, I'm, I'm excited about that. Plus we have the puzzle room and areas for, for people to really enjoy. Just kind of get off by yourself. And that's good, when you're, especially when you're reading. Heartfelt Connections, what is that? We have a specialized program, a signature program at Rolling Green for people with memory loss. It's called Heartfelt Connections. And we have been enhancing the environment for the people who have memory loss because based on research, it's the best thing for them and, and engages them in life in different ways than, than we were able to do before. This by donations, wow. That is awesome. Back porch, right back here. What's that about? Well, after this meeting, you know, people want to want to go out there and talk about what I didn't say <laughs> or, or whatever. But you know, after these meetings and after services and so on, we've got a place where people can go and just enjoy. And you know, it's it's shaded at least during portions of the day. So it's you know, and Amy and. Jane and, and the troop really have done a nice job. And we've got fans out there, so it's a little cooler. Okay, this is the patio out in front of the lake. Uh, you can see all the shade. Um, <laughs> and, but you can also see you know, the sidewalk itself. And again, they're wider than they were. Um, are we done with all that? No. Um, we, we work with contractors. By the way, have you noticed that contractors don't come when they say? <laughs> and I, I, I heard a guy, um, I heard that a cable guy asked somebody what time it was, and he said, sometime between eight and one. <laughs> you know, that's, um, that's how it is. We have, no, we have very little control over the contractors because they don't have staff either. And their timing is their timing, and they get overbooked. So we're working hard to, to get things done. It's been challenging. Um, it delayed the hallway project, for example, for months. But, okay, we'll go next. Okay. This is really the, the final one, then I'll shut up, sort of. You know, the thing that makes Rolling Green is that we have, we have services available for, for you, and that's, that's our purpose. Um, we do many things well. Some things we're still learning, some things we're reorganizing. But by offering you the services and the opportunity to engage with the services and with those who provide the service and with how we do those services, it creates meaningful life for you. And we are, we are a community. And that's, that's the, the important thing to remember. Um, we provide you know, financial and life state assurances, financial services, and it's the way we offer these services and you know, that, that was three pages list of things, it's because we're all jointly sharing the cost. You all are jointly sharing the cost. That's how we do it. Um, you benefit from the, the services and, and benefits that you, you actually access. So if you, if you don't like going to the patio, you're probably not going to benefit from it, but a lot of people will. 
And you know, if you don't like to exercise, you know, the exercise area, the wellness area might not fit for you, but for many people it does. And hopefully you'll not have to use the clinic because you're not feeling well, but it's there if you need it. Um, Rolling Green is not this or that. It's not a patio home or apartment. Rolling Green is us, and it's all of us, residents and staff alike. Any questions, comments? Yeah, please. Will we get a copy of this? Will we get a copy of this? Would it be helpful? Yes. Yeah, um, it's 30 pages long. <laughs> so we'll put them all on one sheet. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, would, would you be all right if we if we pick out kind of the main the main yeah. pages? Yeah, because it's it's long. Well, some and other people were not here, like my husband, and he would. Yeah, put it on the portal. Yeah, yeah we can get it on the portal. Yeah, oh, well, I'll never get it. Yeah, we can never get it then. Yes, but we can also, you know, with. Uh, I don't know that we'll get it out tomorrow because well, no, tomorrow's no, no, no. Friday. But uh, we'll send out you know, several of the pages, and, and if you have some thoughts on what was the most meaningful for you, that would help us too. Uh, yes, please. Why can't uh, each homeowners association have one copy? Why can't it? Yeah, we can, give, we can pass yeah. it around to our. Uh, yeah, we can give a copy. Yeah, we can send it over to the HOA presidents. Yeah. Please. Here's a question. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Um, what percentage of people in independent living have to ever use the other services? Great question. What percentage of the people in independent living have to use the other services? Uh, you mean like the health center? No, I mean like memory care, rehab. Uh, oh, yes. Um, I have the statistics the opposite direction. Let me explain. About 25% of the people who go through our rehab area live here. And a high percentage, what do, you, what do you suppose in the nursing home, what percentage of people are from here? Probably 40%? It's, yeah, maybe 30 or 40%, I don't have the number. Yeah, memorized. yeah, so we have a significant number of people there, as well as memory care, and you know, most of the people in memory care and assisted living are from here, um, and they, they moved there. But you don't know the statistics the other way. Yeah, yeah, I don't have the statistics the other way of, you know, now, I will, I, I can say this. When you move in, uh, for the people who've moved in in the last seven years, we started doing an, uh, an actuarial evaluation. You know how everybody turns into confidential financial thing, right? And we, we have an actuarial system that doesn't put your name in it, but we put the data in. And it, and it calculates what is the likelihood that you'll have funds for the rest of your life. And we have to do that because um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, and we need to ensure that there are sufficient funds to keep going, even though we know that some people will run out of funds. Um, and so we have an actuary projection, but it's based on averages for each person. So I know for me, I haven't gone through the program, but the financial planners, um, the financial planners say, oh, Bob, you're going to live till 92, you need to put all your money with us. <laughs> and then Social Security says the average life, Bob, for you is 86. And my wife says, you do that again, and then you're not going to live another day. You know, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't have it the other way. But that's a really good question. Did you get that information? I will see if we can get that. I'm not sure that because what we'd have to do is we'd have to do an actuarial study to really go back, and, and that we don't have. Um, it's a really good question, but um, it is it is a percentage. That I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. Please. You mentioned at the beginning of this the importance of communicating. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know how highly you feel about marketing and the job they're doing, bringing in new people. Um, I have my possession, what we get every month mm -hmm. is a calendar for the whole month, right? Yeah. All right, in the month of August, there was a, um, uh, what's it called? The um, activity fair mm -hmm. planned for August 30th. 
I have a friend who lives in Cascades, and she keeps getting marketing um, information that said, um, and she gave it to me on August 9th, she had received it, said, June, did you know you're having uh, rodeo <laughs> on August 30th? I said, no. And because I am aware of a number of things, I called Amy. I said, Amy, did you know? And she said, no, there's something wrong with the communications when in print you're doing something and another division of yours arranges something else. Actually, I can explain that. Imagine that. I, I do hear you, you know, I hear you. Here's the deal. I'll use the rodeo as an example. Um, we have about 1,300 people in our, in our lead space, okay, somewhere around there. And we send out, um, and including your friend at the Cascades, and for marketing events, which are to introduce people to Rolling Green, we send out a mailing list to people off, off site. We let residents know much closer to the event because we won't know how many people are gonna come until we get a list. And it is a marketing event. Now, we also put it out, you know, a couple of weeks ahead of time about the rodeo uh, to residents because we knew at that point we were gonna have about 113 people come. And so, um, as we get closer to those major events, some of them, uh, we notify people outside because frankly, that's how we fill vacant apartments cottages and patio homes. When did she, when did someone decide that you're gonna have a rodeo? Do you all get together at any point and talk to one another? Do we talk to them a lot? Heavens no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that answers, you know, we, we try to. We, we actually, we very much try to. Um, sometimes things get missed, and I, okay, I do apologize. you can't tell me that that thing wasn't planned at least a month before. You don't yeah. put in a tent and all that. Well, then why doesn't she say something at the, at, don't you have meetings? Don't you? Yeah, we okay. do. It was, it was just overlooked. Oh, that's not the first time, sir. I know. Okay. Most, many of the marketing things over the years, you know, again, they're intended to bring in, you know, for example, the lunch and learns. You know, we, we don't normally notify residents for some of those things. Uh, on the major events, we try to, but we like to know how many prospects we're going to have so we have enough funds for the whatever. I, but I do hear you. And should we be communicating more clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Well, if they came to the rodeo or didn't come, don't worry. They didn't have a real horse, so you didn't get a chance to ride. No real horse. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Did I see a hand over here? Hand over here? Uh, please. Unless I misunderstood, you mentioned when you started talking about you were excited about something in one of the areas and you were going to tell us. I'm so glad you asked. Oh, I, I didn't. And I know you're questions. excited, but I didn't know if it was the right area. I don't have five dollars to give it to you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, What's the question? We have signed a contract with Prisma to provide um, a nurse practitioner or an allied health professional in the clinic for a certain amount of time. Meaning that they will provide the services to you. And you know, Prisma charges, by the way, but um, we have not had um, a physician or nurse practitioner down in there for really several years. And we've, we've been working on this contract for three years? Too long. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's been an arduous thing. And one of the things in the resident surveys is, you know, we'd like to have a doctor or, or nurse practitioner on campus. And Shannon and Jane, they're, they're awesome, but they, they need somebody who can prescribe meds. And so uh, Prisma doesn't know exactly how much demand there's gonna be from you. So they're gonna start with a couple half days. Um, but it's going to, it's several months because they have to get the person and they have staffing issues too, imagine. But um, so it'll be before the end of the year. So I'm really excited about that. Um, so you think it'll run kind of like a sick call? Or kind, kind of like a sick call. Go down there and, and, and if they decide that it's 
necessary, they can actually write a prescription? They can write prescriptions, yeah. It's kind of like, uh, not quite in the urgent care, but getting close to it. Okay. Is that, does that describe it? Yeah, I do believe they're gonna look at providing primary care services as well. So it'll be primary care services and or like an urgent care where you have a sniffle or something you wouldn't see some by somebody that day. So yeah, it'll be, it'll be both. Yeah, so both primary care services and, and urgent care. So we're excited, well, we're excited about that. Ryan has really worked that, that contract out, and I'm really proud and thankful for that. It's good. Yeah, please. You mentioned working on getting housekeeping back for patio homes. Housekeeping for patio homes, yes. Is that a possibility soon? You know, um, I, 